Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, hello. My name is Devin Lau. I'm the Associate Director for Yale Center Beijing, uh, and very happy to see so many of you guys joining us today. Um, for those of you guys that are joining us for the first time, uh, we have hosted a series of talks over the last few years, uh, highlighting some of the books being published by uh, Yale University Press. And uh, this one caught my eye very quickly uh, when I saw that it was coming out, um, The Art Lover's Guide to Japanese Museums. And I immediately jumped on the opportunity to host our speaker today, Sophie Richard, um, on this amazing topic. Uh, and I know many of us are very eager to uh, be able to travel again internationally. And so uh, this is uh, a good preparation for that as we get ready, um, hopefully, fingers crossed, to be able to travel more freely. Um, I know that uh, Sophie herself has recently traveled to, to Japan, um, and so uh, she's uh, able to send us a report back. Um, let me introduce our speaker and um, turn things over to her. Um, I've already had a sneak peek at some of the museums that she's going to be able to talk about. Um, and I'm very excited. I, I, I'm lucky enough to have been to some of them. Um, and I can attest to how amazing and beautiful they are. Uh, and I'm hoping to check off um, at least the rest of today's museums the next time I go to Japan. Um, but she has a whole book um, that has a lot more options. Um, so even if you've been to some of these, um, there's many more to look forward to. Um, so let me introduce our speaker and then we'll get started. Uh, Sophie Richard is a writer and art historian uh, born in Provence and educated at the Ecole de Louvre and the Sorbonne in Paris. She's worked in the art world in New York uh, before moving to London, where she is now based. Uh, and she's been traveling to Japan for the past 17 years now. Passionate about Japanese arts and culture, she set out to explore the country's many museums, an ambitious goal. Um, but one I think that she's done a great job of so far. Uh, her, her first book on the subject was published in 2014 and was subsequently translated into Japanese. And her second uh, book, um, The Art Lover's Guide to Japanese Museums, which we'll be looking at today, uh, was published uh, more recently and then will also be available in Japanese. Her articles have appeared in magazines in the US, the UK, and Japan, and she's been a contributor to Japanese television programs. Uh, where her work uh, has been the basis for two recent television series on the country's many art museums. She's been lecturing in Europe and in Japan, uh, and I guess now uh, technically in the US and China. <laughs> um, and she is currently producing a series of video interviews under the title Encounters with Japan. Um, in 2015, her work was recognized by the Agency of Cultural Affairs in Japan, and she received the Commissioner's Award. Uh, so we're very lucky to have here join us today. Uh, and I'm personally very much excited to, um, to hear what she has to share with us. And um, as a last note, if people could please, uh, as much as possible, turn on your uh, video camera so that we can all see you, um, that would be much appreciated. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it over to Sophie. Well, hello everyone. I'm delighted to be with you today and to be able to share uh, my experiences and my motivation for writing this book um, and tell you a bit, a bit about my research. Um, I've been researching art museums for uh, about 12 years in Japan and published books and articles on the subject. I originally studied art history at the Ecole du Louvre uh, in Paris, which is located within the museum. So I feel at ease in museums and I'm curious about the history. Uh, so when I first went to Japan about 20, 17 years ago now, I think, um, I did what I do anywhere. Um, when I travel in the world, I set out to visit museums. Um, what brought me to Japan originally was a fascination for the country and its culture from a very young age, um, in particular, the traditional aesthetics and traditional architecture. It's not particularly remarkable, you know, the French and the Japanese have had this sort of long standing mutual love affair. And I think I first encountered Japanese art um, in art books on Western art, because Japan was such a source of inspiration for many Western, particularly French artists. So this is how I, my family had no connection. This is how I first saw Japanese art and aesthetic. 
so when I finally went to Japan after dreaming about it for so many years, um, I naturally planned to visit a lot of museums. This was for me the best gateway into the culture and the country uh, from past centuries to today. That was really important for me, this sort of range uh, chronologically. Um, and I, I also thought about museums as a thread to follow in devising my itineraries not only in places like Tokyo and Kyoto, um, but this quest, if you will, also allowed me to travel far and wide uh, and to explore remote areas. The museums were the ideal excuse to travel far and wide. Um, and to go, going to all these museums was really rewarding. Uh, during my visits, I could see art, of course, exhibited on the walls, uh, but I could also experience many other things outstanding examples of architecture from different periods, interior designs, there were gardens to admire, as well as a fascinating but more subtle aspect. For example, the difference in ways to display art um, in different countries, uh, the behavior of visitors in the galleries, certain things like that that were quite subtle that I really enjoyed as a, as a foreign visitors. So all this was very exciting, but I, also quickly discovered that there was um, a huge amount to see, but it was not really straightforward. It was not easy to find information, especially when I started all this 17 years ago. Um, and in particular, I really, really struggled to find accurate description of what these museums were about, uh, the, what was being showed at the time of a potential visit, uh, the story of the museums. Um, so that was a hurdle. And also while there were many good places, fantastic places to visit, uh, I also happened sometimes to be visiting venues that were not really interesting. Uh, they could be disappointing because they were not very well run or the collection was great. Um, in parallel to all that, when I was discussing my trips to Japan in the UK where I live, um, I was asked if there were many museums there or if there were any museums at all. Um, there was really, it was an unknown thing um, for foreign, at least in the, in the West. Um, so all this combined made me think that I should research them more systematically and write about them to introduce them to a foreign audience. Um, in a way, I can say that I wrote the book that I wanted to have as a first time visitor to Japan. Um, I really saw museums as a portal to discover Japan. And I was struck really by the sheer number that existed, but also by the range and the variety of the museums. So this is really what led me to write a book. And in doing so, what I tried is to really offer a portrait of each of the museums that uh, I selected to, to feature in the book. Um, so to uh, start, I would like to tell you about a significant visit um, that took place in uh, this house called Kyu Asakura in Tokyo. It's um, really in the center of the capital, and I stumbled upon it by chance. I, it was it's a, located in Daikanyama in a very trendy area, and I was just walking around, and I was attracted to uh, that corner behind a modern building because there were trees and I thought maybe there is a garden there and I can take a break. And it turns out that it was a historical home open to the public. Um, the house was built in 1919, so it's not very old, but it was built according to traditional design. And it was built for the Asakura family, which was a important family in the area since the Edo period. Um, and um, during that visit, I realized that all my senses were awakened and engaged. I could enjoy the smell of the tatami and the different woods um, that were part of the decorative elements. I could feel the tatami uh, flow under my feet because this is being a traditional house, you're asked to remove your shoes before entering. Actually, a number of museums do that in Japan. Um, I could hear sounds from the garden. Uh, so this was sensory experience as well as an intellectual one. Um, I had the house for myself that day. Um, so I had a bit of an epiphany and this is when I really decided to write a book um, about the museum I had seen in Japan and those I was hoping to discover. 
And here I can show you, uh, so at the back of the garden, uh, there is this lovely building called Kura. Uh, this is a storehouse uh, where um, people would keep their uh, precious belonging. This is the only part of a traditional Japanese home to be built in stone. Uh, and this is why their precious belonging would be protected in case of fire. So this is um, a special building that every well-to-do traditional house uh, would have in Japan. Um, in this case, in, at Kyua Sakura, it is not open to the public, but many other museums in Japan have turned the kuras in beautiful, uh, lovely uh, display galleries. Um, so when I started writing, um, as I mentioned, Japanese museums were really little known at an international level. Uh, and if they were usually, that would be through the prism of contemporary architecture because the, the museum was the work of a famous architect. So it would be published in books or magazines, but not much was said about what was happening inside. So I decided I should do something about it. And this became a bit of a mission really. Um, so my research is always based on on-site visit, of course, and I always organize in advance a meeting with the museum director or curator so that I can interview them and understand uh, more about the museum and get uh, information you can't get by just reading their brochures or uh, their website if they have one in English. Um, the book is organized in broad geographical groupings and today I will show you a small selection with a few venues, each different kind of museums in a variety of locations. Uh, it was difficult to choose but I, I chose about 10 to give you a taste. Um, so still in Tokyo but a really different type of um, of uh, of museum is um, the gallery of Horyuji treasures uh, which is part of the National Museum in Tokyo so this is a large public institution made of different buildings and this one is really um, one of my favorites it's by celebrated architect Taniguchi Yoshio um, and it's uh, really one of my favorite not only for the beauty of the architecture, the interior design, but the importance of the, the collection. Um, it's a very good example of Taniguchi's work. Um, you can say that there is an interplay of textures and transparencies, very clean lines. And he also uses the water to reflect the building um, in this beautiful sort of man-made pond. Um, and inside, uh, as you go upstairs in the first floor, you have um, this amazing gallery with um, a group of about 50 uh, early Buddhist sculptures that look at you. It's a very impressive um, room. Um, and the whole of the collection of the gallery and this particular room dates from the 6th to the 8th century at a time when Buddhism arrived in Japan. So it's really the first centuries of Buddhism in Japan. It's a fascinating collection, very, very important collection. Um, next, um, uh, let's leave Tokyo for Kyoto and a different kind of museum. This is an artist house. I have a particular fondness for this kind of museums. Uh, they're time capsules, uh, so they really allow you for an immersion into the artist's private and creative life, as well as his or her times. Um, Kawaii Kanjiro was a prolific potter. He was one of the founders of the Minge movement. And when he passed away in 1966, his family decided to keep the house as it was. And a few years ago, they were able to open it as a, as a museum. And they, they, so the descendants run the museum. And as you might see, thanks to these images, um, this is a museum without any wardens. There are no labels. Uh, visitors are free to move around as they wish. And uh, you can even sit on some of the furniture as you might see this, this gentleman here is, is sitting on a furniture that belonged to Kawaii Kanjiro. And that was very probably designed by him because he designed the whole house himself and sort of partly built it. Um, so this is a very beautiful place, very atmospheric, very evocative of his work. And going through the garden, you can access his studio, um, so where he worked. Here you see the 
this uh, potter's table and turntable and um, at the back of the garden there is his kiln uh, which is very precious because it's one of the very few left in central Kyoto. The area the museum is in uh, was a potter's area there were many others but uh, they've been destroyed over time so um, this one is uh, really one of the very few still extant and it's fascinating to see. It's called a noborigama it's a type it's a climbing kiln uh which is the one he used and then even after he passed away for a few years other potters of the area could could still come and use it until it was closed uh, at the request of the kyoto city just for, for safety uh, still in kyoto i would like to show you the raku museum uh, it's in central kyoto just not, not, not far from the imperial palace so this presents the history um, of and the works of the Raku family, which is a very important dynasty of potters active since the 16th century. It's now the 16th generation who is uh, uh, heading the family. The museum is run by the family and very elegantly designed and presented. There are other examples of private museums, such as this one, founded and managed by a family of uh, craftsmen or artists, and that really zooms in on their um, the family history and production. Interestingly, so this is a lovely, very big museum, really uh, I highly recommend a visit. Interestingly, um, a few years ago, uh, the 15th head of um, the family, so he, now his son has taken over, uh, was contacted by a museum just outside of Kyoto, uh, this one, the Sagawa Museum. Um, this is a museum that's run by a local delivery company, so it's a private museum run by a company. Uh, they contacted Mr. Raku and said, we would like to do an exhibition with you. So what turned, what started as a simple discussion about an art exhibition turned out to become an amazing um, and really exciting architectural project. So Mr. Raku, as I mentioned, was a ceramicist and he ended up designing an entirely new wing in this museum, partly underground. So please have a look at the uh, lake you see here, which is man-made because we'll, we'll see it again. Um, and he ended up designing uh, an entirely new wing that includes uh, exhibition rooms and two fantastic um, tea rooms for the tea ceremony. So the one you see here is actually underground, but there is natural light filtering through from the top. Um, he used a fantastic mix of natural, uh, domestic and foreign uh, materials. So there is Japanese washi, the traditional paper, but woods, different woods from Africa, uh, and um, reclaimed uh, wood from Australian railways, wood from America, uh, stone from Zimbabwe. So it's a fantastic mix of textures and colors. Um, and the second tea room is uh, much larger. This is um, the stone from Zimbabwe I was uh, mentioning, and it is uh, uh, actually built at water level. Um, so the, 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 the slide we saw earlier, actually the, the, you, you, that's what you see from within the, the tea room. And we're here at um, water level. And when you're kneeling on the tatami to participate in a tea gathering, you're actually at the same level as the reeds in the water. And that was really what Mr. Rack wanted us to feel when he designed the room. Um, so this is really fascinating, I find, because this man uh, is a potter and he designed this fantastic um, architectural project. He actually got a prize for it. Um, and what I also wanted to lead on from here is the fact that uh, tea culture and, uh, you know, we all say tea ceremony, and it's the most uh, quintessential of uh, uh, Japanese uh, cultural phenomenon, but it's much better if we can to actually say tea culture, because tea ceremony is not an ideal translation of, um, of the Japanese uh, expression. So let's say tea culture. Um, tea culture 
lends itself particularly well to the work of museums. There is an, an almost natural connection between the two. As a tea practitioner, you are going to collect various forms of art um, and um, that can bring you to opening your own museums. Um, tea culture encompasses many forms of art from of course the ceramic with a tea ball at the center of the event, but also lacquer, bamboo art, metalwork, painting, and even architecture, interior design and garden design. Um, so there is a lot of links between tea culture and museums throughout Japan. But museums in Japan, of course, do not only show uh, solely Japanese art, and there are in fact really good connection of Chinese and Korean art, as well as Western art. So uh, to show you today an example of Western art, um, I selected the Nakamura Keith Herring collection, uh, which is located northwest of Tokyo in a very green mountainous area. Um, and this is a smallish private museum that was opened by uh, a businessman, Mr. Nakamura, who discovered the work of Keith Haring uh, while he was on a business trip to New York in the late 80s, and he fell in love. He was really attracted, intrigued by his work, and then completely fell in love with it, ended up collecting over 160 works, I think, and opened his own museums dedicated to, to the artists. And it's the only one solely dedicated to the artists that exists in the world. Um, and that's something I've seen before, for example, until a few years ago, um, the Lalik Museum in, in Japan was the only museum in Japan dedicated to Lalik until one opened in France a few years ago. Um, so as you can see, the museum is quite colorful. Um, one of the, its attractiveness actually is um, uh, the really dynamic architecture. And there is a lot of um, um, mix between um, dark and uh, really light field galleries. And this was envis envisioned by the architect and the museum founder as a way to evoke the, to evoke, sorry, the Burstrow's life and time of um, Keith Haring. Um, and next to the museum, uh, design, I'm sorry, the quality of my photo is not great, um, but I, I, I took it uh, on a visit myself. Uh, so next to the museum, and designed by the same architect uh, called Kita Gawara Atsushi, there is a day spa. And so you're really encouraged to visit the two on the same day. Um, and while you're there in this uh, lovely day spa, you can enjoy the local hot springs. Um, and this is something I really try to convey in the book after each entry on a particular museum, I give suggestions of things to do nearby or maybe somewhere else in Japan, but in connection with uh, the museum that was in discussion. Um, and I really envisage museum going as a holistic activity. Maybe you find something by chance on the way to a museum or there is something um, special, a little bit different to do in the museum or next to the museum. So this is, there are lots of tips and recommendations I give um, next to each entry. Um, now, leaving Honshu, the main island uh, in Japan, I would like to take you to uh, the Inland Sea and a group of museums uh, called the Benese Art Foundation. Uh, this is very famous, I'm sure many of you will have heard of it. Um, an exciting aspect of the museum world in Japan is a very strong connection with nature. Many museums are in the countryside um, and often uh, a visit becomes a bit of an adventure. And in this case, the island of Naoshima has become a bit of a art pilgrimage. The founder, a businessman and visionary, I think, uh, believed in the potential of art and architecture to create places in harmony with nature um, where the conditions ensure well-being, uh, benessere in Italian, and this is how he came up with the name Benesse for, for his um, foundation. 
So here you see Benesse House, which is the first uh, museum to open over 25 years ago, designed by Tadao Endo. And as you can see, there is uh, art inside and outside, beautiful scenery. Over time, more museums have opened uh, on the island of Naoshima. Another uh, one, it's called the Chichu Museum, also designed by Tadao Endo with um, a fantastic room um, dedicated to Monet with only natural light filtering through the, the top. Um, and over time, uh, the project um, developed to a neighboring islands and included other architects. So here, um, oh, sorry, another uh, example of a museum uh, by Tadao Endo on Naoshima, this time dedicated to Li Ufan. Beautiful space, um, beautiful setting, and uh, look at that's the view you have uh, from the museum. So um, if that doesn't make you want to go, I don't know what will, you know, you hear birds, I mean, it, it's a fabulous place. And so on one of these other two islands where the foundation has uh, developed new projects is the Teshima Art Museum. And it's a really enchanting building by an architect called Nishizawa Riwe, who collaborated with the artist Reinato to create a large single room. Um, there, there are no columns. It's really the way you see. You see it's on this photograph and it's in the shape of a drop of water as it uh, lands on the ground. And it's completely open to the element. Inside, um, visitors are asked to remove their shoes and to remain silent. And of course, by removing your shoes, you, th there is just less noise naturally. So everybody is silent um, without thinking about it. And um, here you can observe uh, nature in a very calming, organic, art installation. Um, it can rain inside. Uh, I don't know if you can see, there is a little wire that's hanging from the ceiling. So you can also see the wind. There are dragonflies flying in. It's, it's really uh, beautiful. People lie down, some stay for hours. It's, it's magical. Um, and when this museum was built, so, so you see it's, um, that's the entrance to the bookstore and cafe, that's the museum itself. Um, it's, among, it's set amongst rice paddies, which were not as beautiful when the museum was being under construction. Actually, rice paddies had been uh, abandoned by the local inhabitants. It's an area that has suffered pollution, depopulation, one of the ideas of the uh, foundation was to help um, the islands um, uh, be revived. And um, when they started constructing the building, they decided that they would um, uh, help regenerate the landscape. And one of the main things to do for that was to replant the rice paddies. And when I interviewed one of the curators, he explained to me that as they were building the museum and, and, and working on the rice paddies, all the people involved with the museum, so the museum staff was helping local inhabitants to replant the rice paddies. So really uh, everybody was involved um, in this um, um, regeneration of the landscape and the participation of the local population as well as the museum staff was essential to the project. And the, the curator told me in fact that as he was doing this, uh, a lady next to him was in tears planting the rice and he said, what's happening? Why are you crying? And she said that after feeling guilty all her life, she felt she was respecting her ancestors wish to have rice paddies on the island. Rice is um, a very important and symbolic part of um, Japanese culture. And um, for many on the island, not having rice paddies, having abandoned them was um, a very sad state of affairs. So the museum helped regenerate that as well. And I thought it was a very moving story. Um, and in my work, I also try to share those anecdotes that I receive from um, the museum staff when I, when I go and interview them, and I, I think it's, it's really meaningful. Um, another uh, special museum from 
for com completely different reasons is uh, this one, the Takenaka Carpentry Tool Museum in Kobe in central Japan. So we're back on the, on the main island. Um, during all my years of research, as you can imagine, I received a number of recommendations from people I know in Japan. So this was recommended to me, but I, I have to admit I was quite doubtful. So the tool museum, is it going to be too specialized, too technical, too removed, too far removed from an art museum? So I went, but um, having lots of misgivings beforehand. And I ended up loving uh, my visit. And of course, I included it in the book. The building is very handsome. What you see is um, the only part that's on. And when, by the way, we're in central, you can't imagine that, but we're in central Kobe, but um, there is there are mountains just in the back. Um, so the entrance is on the ground floor and everything else is underground. Um, Takenaka was originally a carpentry firm uh, created in the Edo period, and now it's one of uh, Japan's largest construction companies. In fact, they've built many museums that are in my book, um, and here they built this one in their own name, and they did a remarkable job. Inside the displays are, so, and so this is the entrance, and you see this fantastic um, ceiling. Um, that, and so going underground, one of the galleries um, with one of its um, fascinating, very informative, as well as very elegant displays. So the museum collects tools for carpentry as well as metalwork. Um, and there are models, there is a full scale tea house, there are videos that are very instructive. Um, and visitors are introduced not only to the method, methods and skills of Japanese um, carpenters and craftsmen, but also to their spirit and aesthetic sensibilities. There are um, lots of tactile displays. You, uh, you can smell different woods, you can touch different woods. It's, it's um, really fascinating. So this is a museum with a very specific focus. Uh, but that offers an enlightening way to learn and look at a variety of art forms via the prism of techniques and tools. Um, one last type of museum I thought I could mention today, um, and which is often found in a museum in Japan, sorry, are open air museums. Um, so it was hard to choose which one to show you today, but in the end, I decided upon this one, um, which is the Kan Yasuda Sculpture Museum. Uh, it's also called Arte Piazza Bibai. Um, so it's in Hokkaido, the northern island of Japan. So my research really took me from Okinawa in the south to uh, Hokkaido in the north. And Bibai is uh, the name of a, of a town. Um, Kanya Suda is a living artist uh, who shares his time between Tokyo and Northern Italy, where he finds the marble he likes to work with. But he was born in Bibai, which is a mining town. He remained attached to it, and he decided to open a museum here with the help of the municipality in order to help the locality overcome its economic difficulties and to offer something to the local population. So it's a very personal project and really beautiful. Um, it was, uh, so the building you see in the back is actually a um, primary school that was um, closed. The, as I said, the city is a mining town, the mines have closed, people have left, so the city has been suffering for decades and schools are closing. So on the building of um, a school that didn't exist anymore. He uh, made uh, fantastic museums with works inside and outside. And this is what it looks like inside. It's really beautiful. That's an old classroom, you know, with some of his uh, marble sculpture. So coming from Italy. Uh, and you have a lot of other sculptures outside in a beautiful scenery. Actually, most of the works are outside. So it's, you spend a beautiful half day walking around um, and the artworks are somewhere completely open to the elements and we're in northern Japan on Hokkaido there is um, 
a lot of snow in the winter, but the museum stays open and uh, they create a path so that people can, can walk through. And uh, the photo at the bottom, um, I don't know if you can read this, it, uh, the sign says this area has bears and this photo I took when I was there. So when you walk around uh, the back of the, the land uh, where you have these sort of beautiful sculptures in the shape of gates, you're really in the forest and there are bears because it's Hokkaido. So um, you're being told by the museum to be a little bit careful. I didn't encounter bears, but um, you're told to make noise to scare them away. So you're really in nature when you visit this type of um, museum. Um, so to conclude today, I really wanted to, to show uh, with this small presentation uh, the variety uh, uh, that exists in the museum world in Japan from ancient to contemporary art, including crafts, uh, artist houses, gardens, remarkable architecture from different periods. And there are also small idiosyncratic venues created by individuals that are really passionate. I really believe that there is a museum to suit uh, each and everyone's interests and whet most cultural appetites. Um, so thank you, and I hope this will entice you to visit museums in Japan. Thank you so much, Sophie. That was wonderful. Um, my pleasure. Um, I, I definitely uh, already have a couple of new museums to add to my list um, that I'm looking forward to visit next time. Um, we have some time left for questions from the audience. So if anybody uh, is um, has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand um, and I can call on you and uh, we can have a little bit of uh, discussion time with um, our speaker today. Um, you can also enter your questions in the chat box. Um, but um, the best is if you can raise your hand and uh, turn on your webcam and we can um, have a have a little bit of time to just um, reflect on what we just saw and then just ask any questions that you may have. Hello, a good evening. My subject is Japanese and I, I like uh, Jap Japanese culture very much. Uh, so uh, I want to uh, translate your book uh, into Chinese. Uh, so lots of Chinese uh, can read your book and know lots of things about uh, Japan Museum. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, could I have your email address? Yes, well, uh, you can find um, a way to contact me very easily on my website at sophiarichard.co.uk. Ah, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And maybe more broadly, do you are there plans to translate your book to um, other languages? Well, so I would be very keen on translating it into French. Um, there were discussions that, and everything froze, of course, because of the pandemic. So I'm mm. trying to revive these. And um, there have been discussions about um, translation in Chinese, but then that goes to my publishers and um, something that started uh, in 19 was stopped so let's see if we can revise it yes yeah um, and I have to say I was really pleased when the book uh, my first book was translated into Japanese because of course when I wrote it I had foreign visitors in mind but um, the book did very well in Japanese. No one had uh, done such a research by going to museums and actually interviewing people and then making a selection. So normally what the Japanese had access to would be books with sort of listings of all the museums that exist mm -hmm. and maybe the exhibitions they would do that year, but not um, you know, that many um, words on each museum. Um, and what they're about. So uh, I was really delighted about the reception the book got in, in Japan. And and I may add no small feat to have a book translated into Japanese and, and be so well received by the local uh, population. So that, that speaks volumes to just how unique the book is and um, what a wonderful job you did. Thank you. Uh, Reina. Hi, I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, 
I have a question like are there connections mm -hmm. between Japanese art and French art or similarities between the museums in these two countries? Um, well, there are, as I mentioned um, early on in my talk, there is a strong bond uh, of mutual appreciation between the French and the Japanese. And since, um, particularly in the cultural world, and so in, since the, the late 19th century, lots of French artists was, were buying Japanese art and using it as a, so they would live with it. You know, you see lots of paintings of that period with women wearing kimonos, that there were, you know, real fashion statements and people would be living surrounded by ukiyo-e, Japanese prints and some Japanese ceramics. Um, so there was a trend that also led to Japonism with Japanese art being a major influence in the arts. Um, so there was an influx of, Japanese works of art in France um, that stayed in the art. And then the Japanese themselves also really appreciate French art. So a lot of museums collected French art in um, the 80s and 90s at a time when Japan was booming and lots of private museums were open. Uh, for example, the Ecole de Paris, which is um, French art from the turn of the previous century was uh, particularly en vogue. So there are a number of museums that have strong collections in that period. Uh, so there are bridges like that, um, that uh, I'm always delighted to see, of course, when I'm there in Japan, also a number of curators. So I usually do my work in English, but I can sometimes do the interviews in French. Some curators are, are, are Francophiles, like in Japanophile, and some, museums, I'm thinking about two, because their director um, is a French speaker, have developed strong links with museums in France. So for example, in Paris, you have a museum called the Musée du Quai Branly that has non-Western art, uh, uh, has a strong connection with a museum in Tokyo called the Intermediatek. And so they have special loans, they do special programs together. And this is really, uh, that was started by the strong bond that existed between uh, the director and his counterpart in France. So they have um, very interesting exhibitions uh, running between these two museums. So yeah, there are strong bonds definitely between the two countries. Great question, Reina. Um, are there other, any other sort of interesting connections that we wouldn't expect from uh, particular cultures that seem particularly drawn to, to Japanese museums? Um, well, what happens is, um, I don't know if it's a straight answer to your question, but something that has often um, surprised me at, at, the, at the beginning of my research was the um, number of Chinese works of art uh, in museums. And this was because these works were collected early on in Japan, brought by um, Japanese monks who went to China to study Buddhism um, and other things. And they would bring back works. Um, and sometimes the equivalent might have disappeared in China, but they were kept in Japan. Uh, I remember eight, 10 years ago, there was an exhibition on um, Chinese art, in particular paintings at the V&A in London. And the vast majority of exhibits were actually coming from Japanese museums because you had fantastic, fantastic examples in those collections. Uh, uh, and they, they had been in Japan for, uh, for a long time. So that's an interesting sort of connection between the two countries. Um, and in Kyushu, so the Southern Island, which is in fact closer to uh, the Korean Peninsula and China than Tokyo because of its geographical um, location, uh, they've opened a few years ago uh, an Asian art museum uh, to really show the close links uh, they have with the Asian continent. Um, and there is nothing else like that in Japan. And they very much turn towards um, that um, part of um, Asia. So that's also a very interesting museum. Mm -hmm. So it's not always inward looking. Museums are really looking out as well. Yeah, fascinating. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned the Monet exhibit. 
And that's mm. the most beautiful display of Monet I've seen anywhere in the world. Uh, was at I that agree. Museum. So absolutely, yeah, 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 completely uh, better than what you can see in France. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, great. Uh, another question from the audience, Faya. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sophie. Thanks for your very excellent introduction to uh, Japanese museums. Well, actually, I lived in Japan two years uh, when, mm. uh, yeah, when uh, when I was in college. But I, 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 yeah, I also traveled around Japan, but I didn't visit so many museums. So thank you very much for your introduction. And uh, in your int introduction of the Japanese museums. Uh, it covers many subjects like sculpture, uh, craft, craft work, and um, which subject impressed you the most? And you think that it represents the Japanese culture the, um, how to say, the most or the best? And what Japanese culture attracts you the, mo uh, the most? Thank you. Which craft did you say? Uh, do I think is the subject, most representative subject, subject, subject of, the, of the museum? Um, I think really there is no single answer to that, and this is why I found the subject of museums so exciting because it's completely open. I didn't have to uh, zoom in on only one thing. I really tried to stay a generalist. Um, and this is what I'm hoping the cover of the book conveys, actually. Uh, it was very important for me to choose a photograph that didn't say too much um, about period. I didn't want the book to say, oh, this is about traditional art or this is about contemporary art. So you have this slightly mysterious building um, that draws you in. Um, so. This this is really what I try to do with the book to, to really offer an, uh, offer a wide panorama. Personally, I'm very attracted to traditional aesthetics and traditional art. It's just a taste. Um, but I also I've learned to love contemporary art much more than I thought uh, because I've I've been lucky to see a lot of fantastic places and meet the artists. So. But my heart naturally goes to traditional art, and in particular, Rimpa, which is a, um, a movement uh, that's uh, a few centuries old now, which takes nature and poetry as its uh, uh, central themes. Um, and that's very, very Japanese in uh, terms of styles and uh, techniques. So this is where my heart goes. But with the book, I really try to offer a wide range of um, places to go and things to see. So I hope this answers your your question. I I, I think you're you're right that there's just so such a wide variety and uh, you know a little bit of everything for for all sorts of tastes. So I think that's one of the mm. more unique things and and why this book you know is so amazing because it does cover such a wide scope. Um, along similar lines, I was wondering. If you sort of have any sense of why Japan, why why does Japan have so many different types of museums and um, you know large and small and modern and mm. ancient? Is mm -hmm. there something special about the culture and and the history? Like what you know why why do you think there's such a, a large concentration of uh, amazing museums in Japan? It is the the, the number is remarkable. Um, it's a combination of factors, and as often. Uh, first of all, Japan was the first country in Asia to really develop the idea of the museum. The very first museum in Asia was opened in India in the 1860s, I think. But then we move on to, and there was one. And then quickly, at the end of the 19th century, Japan, as it was modernizing, opening up to um, the rest of the world, and um, in doing so adopted westernization, used museums as a way to um, highlight and present their culture. So the first national museums opened. And then as uh, 
works of art were being bought by foreign collectors, a, a few Japanese collectors decided to open their own museums to present their collections and preventing them from, from leaving the country. So you had that movement early on, the early decades of the 20th century. Uh, then there is a break of the war, the, the, the country is uh, rebuilt, the economy as well, and then you have the boom of the, the 80s. And at that time, uh, there was a race really uh, for building museums. So all the regions wanted their own uh, public museums. So everyone would build their own museum. Uh, there was an emulation in between um, regions and often these are public, public buildings. They're not all great because sometimes you have a building but you don't really have a collection. So this is something to bear in mind. So that was the public side of things. But in the private air arena, there was also a race for building museums. So private collectors, but also companies. And I mentioned uh, one earlier in the presentation, uh, religious cults opened their own museums. Um, so this became something to do. Uh, you get very good uh, tax advantages if you open a museum, of course. But beyond that, um, there was this desire to um, present the art of a region of one's collection. And what I find interesting is that so many people decided to do, on their, to do it on their own. You know, in the West, particularly in America, collectors might give their collection to a museum they have close links with. Well, in Japan, instead of doing that, they open their own museum. So that's fine, that I find quite interesting. This is great because you means that uh, the, the scene is very varied and um, um, you, know, you never quite know what you're going to, to discover. The issue, um, the sort of the drawback of that is that it often depends on a person. So what happens when that person dies, or let's say if it's a company, what happens if the next president or the next generation, the company is not that fond of the museum or not, not that interested. So some museums over the years have or will disappear because they're the project of one person or one entity. So that's a drawback of that. Um, that's very that's very interesting and unfortunate, but um but it makes sense um mm -hmm. what um have you found any museums that that you that um that uh, i guess the japanese local population has has been particularly drawn to that that i think for example if somebody from the west sort of wouldn't have expected it or are there any kind of unique museums that that sort of have been a surprising hit or anything like that mm. Well, um, there are, so one thing that uh, always surprises me is the fact that I, I, you know, especially in the countryside or outside of the big uh, city centers, I go and I can be the only visitor of one of the only visitors. Often, right, granted, when I go for work, I go during the week. You know, so I suppose museums are busy at the weekend, but a lot of museums are don't receive lots of visitors whereas the Japanese are per perfectly happy to queue for hours for big blocks big blockbuster show in the main museums Tokyo and, and Kyoto and so um, when you have an important show people can wait uh, you know a few when was it a few years ago there was a big exhibition in the summer, I mean there were people fainting it was so hot in, in July and August um, and you can they could queue for three hours and and then reversely uh some smaller museums don't get that many visitors so this is also what i'm trying to say in the book that go also to see the small places um and so that's a slight aside but there are also museums for everything and anything in japan so i have not visited uh, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, for a while, next to a place I used to stay at, there was a Snoopy museum. So maybe because the museum is actually a concept brought from the West, the Japanese have, can have a certain flexibility, freedom with the term. So they can be a museum of, there is a museum of 
uh, noodles, there is a beer museum, and there is a Snoopy museum, which always had queues, usually a lot of young people um, queuing to see that museum. So the world is a little bit elastic in Japan, maybe more than it is in, in the West. Um, so for my work, I really concentrated on art museums, but it's fair to say that there are museums for more or less everything in Japan. Certainly. Um, one last chance for anybody in the audience who might have any questions. Um, I mean, I, I feel like I can uh, ask lots of questions, but I, I do want to give people opportunity. Um, anybody in the audience? Okay. Well, if not, thank you so much, Sophie, for a fantastic presentation. Um, I can't wait to be able to travel freely again. Um, so jealous that you got to go. Um, uh, and... It was fantastic. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to tell you much about it, really. But uh, yes, there was starting to be a few foreign visitors coming. So, and uh, of course, it's very positive for the museums. They depend on visitors for the existence. Uh, I'm happy to say there were no closings of museums due to COVID. One museum, which is uh, one of my favorite one in Tokyo closed, but because the founder, this, who is um, now quite elderly, decided to close it's the Hava Museum. Uh, so that's very sad, but not due to COVID, but all the other museums survived, which is fantastic. Um, now visitors are asked to book a time slot in advance. Uh, they want to avoid having too many visitors in one go. But all the, the museums are, are happy and active and willing to receive visitors. And uh, when I was there in particular, there was a fantastic exhibition to celebrate the 150th year um, uh, an anniversary of the Tokyo National Museum. So there were special exhibitions for, for that, um, to celebrate that event. Well, it was the first museum open in Japan. Great. Well, thank you for being sort of the on the ground and and giving us sort of a first glimpse of of what it will look like to be able to travel again. Um, My pleasure. We're all looking forward to it. Um, and I will um, ask everybody to unmute themselves so that um, they can all thank you in person. And also, uh, we haven't uh, done this yet, but uh, as per one of our traditions for one of these online talks, if people want to turn on your webcam so we can take a group picture, um, uh, you know, this is a tradition in both in in China and I think in Japanese culture that a lot of people like taking group yes, pictures. Photos. So yeah. um, for yeah. those of you guys um, who wanted to turn on your webcams, yeah. we can take a group picture as a way to uh, remember okay. this, this lecture today. And I'll also unmute everybody at the same time. Thank you all for coming and listening to this fantastic talk. Thank you, Sophie, again, um, and much appreciated. Thank you, my pleasure. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you so, so much for your sharing. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I'm really want to visit this thank music. You. Thank you very much.